We're very excited today to have our uh, latest series, Sprint, Sprint Technology Impact Series speaker event today, Fireside Chat, with HubSpot co-founder and CEO, Brian Halligan. Woohoo! <laughs> I know you haven't had, had Professor Graywall, yes. but uh, she's also moderating for us today, um, and we're really excited to have her as part of the tech faculty um, teaching marketing and among other things. So um, I will kind of leave it at that and introduce, let them then uh, go ahead with today's session. But, but thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. So. Thank you for being here. Um, I told you I had some notes, so don't mind my notes. Um, but I thought we kind of would just jump right into it. And to get started, um, while most of us in this room, I would say, know what HubSpot is, it's well known on the Tuck campus overall. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> well, I was just kind of hoping that for those who might be a little bit less familiar in the audience, you could tell us a little bit about what your role actually entails at HubSpot, uh, what you do, and how do you find HubSpot's role for other businesses kind of changing or not? Sure. Can you guys hear me? Is that on? Yeah, just go on yes. camera. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for coming. It's it's uh, it's an honor to be here. Really, an honor to be here. I I was in B school just like you guys back in 2005, and I remember coming to these sessions and really enjoying them. So it's it's uh, strange to be in front of you. It's like imposter syndrome <laughs> personified <laughs> right here. Uh, when, we, when I was in business school, that's where we came up with the idea for uh, HubSpot. Uh, my co-founder and I, Dharmesh, were sitting in sessions very similar to this. And the idea for HubSpot really came in a little bit from me and a little bit from Dharmesh. Uh, and I had, the, my part was I did an internship while I was at school at a local venture capital firm called Longworth Ventures, a little tiny VC firm. And what they wanted me was to work with the, the heads of marketing and sales at their startups they had invested in. They had you know, 40 or 50 investments, mostly B2B. And I meet with the head of marketing and he meet with the head of sales CEO and ask them, you know, what's your strategy? How are you going to grow your business? What, what's the plan? And they all had kind of the same plan. We're going to buy a list and email as many people as possible. We're going to hire sales reps and we're going to cold call. We're going to advertise as much as we can afford. We're going to hire the big fancy PR firm. Uh, we're going to do the big trade shows, sort of the, those were the five plays. And they all were doing them, and none of them seemed to be working. Like they were all, they all seemed to be executing it relatively well. I had former colleagues who were in some of these companies. And I started to just grow a little disenchanted with the playbook. And my thesis was people are sick and, sick and tired of being marketed to and are getting quite clever at blocking it out, whether that's caller ID on your phone, or that's spam protection, or ad blocker, or even a DVR back then. It's nearly impossible to reach humans using traditional techniques. And so that was sort of the first thing. You know, marketing seems to be broken. I was sort of wallowing in misery. Dharmesh, my co-founder, maybe similar to you folks, during school, if he went to a lecture that he thought was interesting or a class, he had a little blog on startups.com, and he would blog about that class or about that book he read. And he wrote two, three times a week. And he didn't put any money behind it, and it was just him, and it was part-time. But sure enough, he had a thousand times more interest than any of my wealthy venture-backed startups that had money and talent and all this stuff going on. And what he was quite clever at doing was pulling people in from Google and from the blogosphere and from social media sites, and it was interesting. And we started calling the world that I was living in as doing outbound, interruption-based marketing, old school, bad. And what he was doing was inbound marketing and matching the way he marketed with the way humans actually shopped and purchased and lived their lives. And those two things were you know, in our heads when we were sitting in lectures like this. And then we said, well, let's start a company. And the original company was called Legal Spot, not HubSpot. Many people don't know that. And it was just for law firms. Uh, and we entered the HubSpot back then. It was the, the MIT 50K business plan competition. We lost. Uh, <laughs> we took HubSpot through every class. You know, when you get an assignment in class, you know, what, what are you going to do as the assignment? We took it through new enterprises. There's a guy named Howard Anderson teach here. Sure, Howard Anderson. Yeah, crazy motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he was our professor, and the, the, the germ of the idea for HubSpot actually started in Howard Anderson's new enterprises class. Um, 
Anyway, that's how HubSpot started, or that's how inbound marketing started. And then we said, well, let's help some of my companies do this. So we were evangelizing this idea. You need to transform your marketing to match the way people actually buy today. And we're getting excited, waving our arms around it. And they said, okay, Brian, th you know, this is not going well, so we'll, we'll, do, we'll do whatever you suggest. But to do it, we'd have to put in a new type of website and put in a blog and hire a search engine optimization expert and put in some social media tools and marketing automation and CRM. And the next thing you know, we had a giant science project on our hands. And so HubSpot basically became, how do we solve that problem? How do we build a modern, relatively simple platform for mere mortals so they can move from the old world to the new world? But it all happened very much in a class like this. Uh, we met our, I met my co-founder in a class like this. And, HubSpot very much still feels like a Sloan project that the two of us started and it kind of grew and then we need a little more space and a little more space. And the company feels like, sort of like Google feels like the uh, Stanford uh, Engineering School, HubSpot still feels like an MBA program. It's just this MBA project will, that will never end. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I was asking a little bit about your role Oh. In addition to the history? <laughs> my role? My role's changed. Uh, you know, I'm the CEO, and you know, what you do as the CEO in the beginning of HubSpot, the way we kind of built HubSpot was Darmesh built the software, and I was the sales department, and I was the service department, and I was the QA department. Uh, and then we kind of shared marketing. And... Um, Darmesh works very unusual hours. He, he gets up around 11 or 12 in the afternoon. He starts working around 1, and he works until about 1 in the morning. And we had some overseas developers helping him with it. And so what would happen is all day I'd be demoing the software and trying to sell people on it. And then I had customers, and I'm serving those customers. So all day I'm in the software using it. And so I know the software extremely well, and I know exactly what I want it to do, and I know where all the bugs are. So at the end of the day, I'd be like, here's my top 10 things. Can you take care of them tonight? Darmesh big, no problem. I got it. No problem. In the next day, he's like, oh, I, I cleaned up all 10. And the truth is, he would, he would fix all 10, but create 12 new problems. <laughs> and we went in this cycle for years. And so that was my job in the early days. And by the way, we shared the marketing job, which was an interesting way we learned, because the marketing job was essentially creating content, it was, and it was our blog. And so we wrote, we'd each write an article a day. And the name of the game, this is pre-Facebook, pre-Twitter. The name of the game back then was, how do you get on the front page of, of Dig? Have you heard it? Anyone heard of Dig? It's an old social media site. And Reddit. Reddit kind of died and came back. It was really easy to get on the front page of Reddit, really hard to get on the front page of Dig. But if you got on the front page of Dig, holy crap, you would get a lot of mojo. And so the only area we really competed was, could we get on the front page of Dig, of, Dig and Reddit every day? So we shared that. And I had half and he had half. Now I don't do much. You know, I do stuff like this. Uh, what else do I do? I think a lot. You know, I think a lot. Uh, I spend a lot more time, less time doing stuff. I try to make very few decisions, but good ones, uh, and really think them through in a deep way. Uh, I f the, the, the cadence of HubSpot is kind of interesting. Can I use the whiteboard? Yeah. May I use the whiteboard? Uh, of course. So we have a big conference every year called Inbound. Inbound. And it happens in September. And the course of the year is really interesting. So we just had the conference. And after the conference, between the conference and Jan 1, is our planning season. The planning season is really exciting. Any crazy idea you can come up with, that's the time. Throw it out there. Let's rethink the strategy. Let's really, really go at it. And then by Jan 1, we need to nail down the budget and start to execute. So we're very tight until inbound next year. And then kind of goes like this again for a couple months. And then it's tight. Part of my job is to make these decisions and bring in all the ideas I can and nail this, this down. This is the funnest part of the year for me. The hardest part of my job is to stay out of the, everybody else's business <laughs> while they're trying to execute the rest of the stuff. Like They need room to move and just execute on the plan. But that's a lot of what I do. I think about the strategy. These days, I'm thinking a lot about the strategy. What are we going to do next year? We're going to do the year after. We're going to do the after. Thinking about M&A. Should we start buying companies? What kind of companies should we buy? How do we get good at that? Uh, those are a couple of big things I'm working on right now. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, 
So I was going to go into a slightly different direction about your past I'll career. I'll say one other thing oh. I do. Okay. The other kind of filter I look at during the year is I work on two things. What products are we building for our customers? And then how do we sell those products? Like I kind of narrow it down to those two things. And a lot of the other stuff I can kind of ignore. It's like, what are we building for the customers and why? And then how do we go to market with it? And every year we're building new stuff. And every year we make changes the way we go to market. Uh, that's another kind of filter I look at my job now. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to jump to the end of the questions because I think it is a little bit more okay. relevant to what Whatever you were, because you, like. you seem very excited about the now. Sure. And I'd love to hear about your opinions and thoughts about how marketing has been changing over the past few years with emerging tech. And what do you think is the impact of tech on HubSpot's role, um, what you're doing right now, and kind of how you're thinking about business moving forward? Yeah. How does it impact you during like that inbound like fun time? One of the interesting thing about marketing tech is most people's approach to marketing tech is they go to marketers and they ask them what they want. And, oh, I need to do advertising more efficiently. I need to spam more efficiently. Um, we have never taken that approach. And we've always looked, instead of what marketers wanted or salespeople wanted, we say, how, how are humans like all of us changing our behavior and watching that? and then building products for marketers that they'll need in a year or two, and then teaching marketers how to, how to market in a modern way. And so for example, just very obvious things that are changing in all of your lives are, we used to read a lot, right? Read long form stuff, short form stuff, whatever. More and more we're watching videos, whether that's a YouTube video or an Instagram video. Uh, we used to, in Google, you know, click on those blue links. You remember the, you know those blue links in Google? We don't really click those anymore. Google just gives us the answer, or Alexa gives us the answer. It's moved from sort of long tail search to much more fat head search. We used to email a lot together. Now we use Slack, of course, or we use chat on a website. The whole world's moving from email to chat. So we're trying to watch these trends in normal humans and how they behave and push marketers and sellers to transform their go-to-market to match that. And that's kind of the approach we've always, we still take that approach and it's served us, served us really well actually over time. Okay, thank you. Um, do you think there are any other general trends in tech in addition to like moving from email to chat that our MBAs should kind of keep in mind when they move forward into their own jobs? Yes, uh, very much so. So we've hired a bunch of folks from, not a bunch, we've probably hired four or five tech grads and they've worked out uh, spectacularly well. One in particular, we hired a woman named Allison Elworthy as one of our first MBA interns ever and then one of our first MBA hires ever. And, and she, she led a field trip down to HubSpot, or like a tech trek down to Boston. Um, and she met with us. We were super impressed with her. We ended up hiring her. And now she runs like all the customer operations. She's, she kind of runs HubSpot. Uh, it's great. And then the other people we've hired, like Ellen Pratt we hired. And couple others. The thing that the tuck people have in common that I've noticed is two very useful and hard to acquire things. One is they typically are pretty analytical and they can go into many sources of data and pull data together and come to a conclusion and not spin that conclusion. It's very easy to pull data that makes your conclusion sound good but the tuck people seem to be very clean about how they look at the data and able to get at it. We use a system called Looker. Raise your hand if you know Looker. It's a business intelligence tool. It's a little tricky to use. All the tuck grads are quite, quite good at using Looker to pull data out and pull graphs out to understand what's going on. And then they're very good at coming up with, oh, here's a problem we have, or here's an opportunity we see based on the data. Uh, and so that's part of what they're good at. The second thing that they're good at is, okay, we have a thesis on how to solve that problem or how to take advantage of that opportunity. And the tricky part is everyone at HubSpot's got good ideas, but communicating those ideas out in a crisp, sharp way with data and with either a PowerPoint presentation and verbal uh, argument or with a memo style thing. So for example, in, Tunis, in this season we're in now, this is where the tuck grads seem to be shining, is they come in with really good data, really good insights on what the problems and opportunities are, 
And then when they get in the room to tell their story, you've got one of two choices when you come into a meeting with me to present on what you want to do in the future. One is you can come in with a PowerPoint presentation, and you can only use 10 slides. And so you have to be very good at PowerPoint. Don't just stick a bunch of words on there, but really take PowerPoint to the next level. And it's an important way to communicate. The other is you can write a memo up to six pages long, Amazon style. We sit there and read at the, at the beginning of the meeting, and then we argue about it. The Tuck folks are very, very good at those two things. They're relatively analytical and technical. You can go relatively deep with the data and come up with an idea, and then pretty good at communicating or articulating it either in writing or verbally. Those are important skills. I don't know if you learn them in a particular class, like if you don't learn them in finance, let's say, but statistics, certainly, they're all very good at statistics and quantitative stuff, system dynamics. Uh, but those are two things that if I were encouraging you to pick up on, be a great communicator, written and verbal, and be very analytical and very good with data. Okay. Um, so kind of linked to this, I, you probably have already... i give um, you some other tips oh. that I would think. Uh, <laughs> Just jumping sorry. ahead of my question. Sorry. I'm not needed. There's a, there's a blog we're all uh, obsessed with at HubSpot by a guy named Ben Thompson. Raise your hand if you know Ben Thompson. Yeah, ben Thompson is, has the world's best blog, in my opinion. He writes about tech and strategy. And it's called Stratechery or Strategery. I forget what it's called. Put it, write it down. Write it down. Put it on your phone. <laughs> ben Thompson. Uh, he's a very good thinker about where tech is going, where marketing is going, where the big companies are going, where the small companies are going, where the disruption opportunities are. He's super, super thoughtful. Uh, that would be a good place to start. I would also take uh, Jeff Parker's class. Is that his last name, Jeff? Parker's class? <laughs> yeah, I would take his <laughs> class. He, I think you're in the engineering school. Um, but he teaches a class, and it kind of overlaps with some of Ben Thompson's stuff about tech strategy and about network effects and building a very modern business and really studies in detail how did Google do it, how does Uber do it, how does Airbnb do it. It's non-trivial how they do it. And we're kind of obsessed with, with this these days because as HubSpot, I think we started, you think of some started as a business, we were a marketing apps company, and we built a marketing app. Over time, we've moved to be, call it a front office suite, where we build marketing, sales, and service software. Now we're moving from a front office suite to more of a front office platform. And so we're trying to dig in and learn as much as we can from everyone from early days of eBay to how Uber does it on how to build a platform right. I feel like every company in the world is trying to figure this stuff out now. Every company you're going to go and work for, if you're going to be a tech, whether it's a startup or big company, or whether you're going to go to work for McKinsey, this is the topic du jour. Uh, and it's hard and complicated. So I would take his class would be another piece of advice or read all his stuff. I, I just bought 20 copies of his book and gave it to my whole exec team. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure out if you already answered this question. Because um, I feel like you've given us a lot of really good advice um, with blogs to read. But um, in addition, you've also been an active voice in the development of business leaders. And you've shown that you have a commitment to making um, communities that you interact with stronger. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you view leadership, really. Like, how do you be a leader in business and in communities? Sure. That's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> In terms of communities, well, I'm from Boston. Who's from Boston? I'm just curious, where do people go when they graduate? Who's planning on going to the West Coast? Awesome. Who's going to go to New York? Who's going to Boston? Who has no fucking idea where they're going? <laughs> Are you posting this video somewhere? Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too much coffee. Um, what's the question again? Oh, communities. Leadership and communities. Yes. I feel like for a long time, the the the, the north star for CEOs, particularly of public companies, is you're solving for the shareholder. And you guys probably talk about this in your class now. We didn't talk about it when we were at Sloan. We really just talked about the CEO's job is to solve for the stock price and for the shareholder. Um, I think you need to solve for the shareholder, of course, 
but you need to solve for the customer and for us partners and employees. And this is the one that's kind of the most interesting because unless your employees are happy, these guys, these guys, and these guys won't be happy. Uh, so we, we spend a lot of energy thinking about our culture and how to build a unique value prop to attract and retain employees. And I think that's paid off for us. So we focus on all three. You have a lot of options, a lot. You could start a company. Pretty easy to start a company these days. You could go to Amazon or Google. You could go to Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley. You could go to some startup that I've never heard of that could be a huge company. Um, and so it's hard to, to, to get you. And then once we get you, it's hard to retain you because people are constantly trying to uh, recruit our employees. And so this employee part, I think, is a really key to building a sustainable company that can really grow. I think employees like you also are different than I was when I first found a job. People stayed in companies for a lot longer when I first found a job. People see jobs much more as like tours of duty today. Uh, I also feel like all of you are much more mission driven than I was when I first started my career. I just wanted a good job and make some dough. Uh, and I want to kind of the American dream. I feel like the economy is so good and all of you growing up in a different economic environment, a different social environment, and you're much more mission driven. And so I think for CEOs today to just look at shareholders as your constituency, I think it's a very short term strategy. You're really going to is really going to get hurt uh, quite quickly. And so we try to balance it out with a lot of a lot of emphasis on employees and trying to make ourselves a unique, attractive place to work. The shareholder thing is interesting too. We're public now, and we've got this, these shareholders, uh, some of which are, are, they say they're long only, like Fidelity or Wellington, they say they're long only. They're not. They trade in and out of your stock. And then you have uh, short sellers. They're in and out of your stock quite a bit. Hedge funds are in and out of your stock uh, quite a bit. If you were solving for the short sellers, and if we were just solving for the stock price, I could easily get the stock price up 30% by solving for the short term. I'd hire a ton of sales reps. Uh, I wouldn't give raises to the employees. Uh, I'd shrink my service organization. Uh, I'd crank my profits up by starving R&D, which would be really easy to do. Uh, but it would be a very short term sugar high and it would come crashing down on us. You really have to, as a CEO, push back on the shareholders and think much more long term or you'll really get eaten up uh, quite quickly. Whatever you like. The one last question I had is a little bit um, in a different tangent, so I thought I might let some of the MBAs, if anyone had a question on the topics. One other leaders. question oh. I saw on the list. Uh, <laughs> oh, one other question I saw on the list uh, that I, I, I didn't quite answer. Uh, how does the marketing industry change, marketing software industry change? So when we started in the marketing software industry, how many marketing software industry, do you, uh, software companies do you think there were in, in 2006? How many Seven. What do you think, Luke? Ten. <laughs> okay, it's 15. How many do you think there are now? Six thousand. It went from fifteen to six thousand. Well, what does that say? What does that say to you? I don't know. It's like people are looking for technology for technology for marketing. What does it say about the economy? Um, easy to start business. Easy to start. <laughs> Why is it easy to start? What is it, what's different today? Exactly. What's, so what's cheaper? Money's everywhere, right? And money's cheap. Debt is cheap. Uh, venture capital is cheap. What else is cheap? Sort of. What else is cheap? How about office space? Do you need office space anymore? If you do, where do you go? We work. We work. And, and how long is that contract? Monthly. What else is cheap? How about the platform you're building on, the servers? Is that expensive now? No. Where do you go? AWS. AWS. Is that a long contract? 
No, uh, month to month. What else do you need? People. people. Where can you hire people? Offshore you can use offshore labor. You can use all kinds of clever ways to get people today. Uh, how about hard, the hardware business? Is that harder or easier? Let's say you want to make some device or you want to make a new coffee cup. You can make a new coffee cup in three weeks in China now, and it's so fast. CAD tools are nearly free today compared to what they used to be. Rapid manufacturing systems are like free. And so the barrier to start a company is zilch. It is incredibly easy to start a company. Now, the downside of that is you start a company, and there's only, there's only 15 of them, you know, you're fine. You've got a unique value prop, but now you've got 6,000 of them. And so it's easy to start, and it's hard to scale. Really, really hard to scale. It's really hard to stand out. Your marketing's hard to stand out. Your employment brand's hard to stand out. I mean, we got competitors just, when you think of the competitive landscape for HubSpot, most of these are startups. Who else does HubSpot compete with? Who else does HubSpot compete with? Staff employers. Like? Salesforce. 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 Is that a good company? Yeah. yeah. Who else? Eloqua, who owns Eloqua? Oracle. Good company? Well, I used to work there, so no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who else? It was done by Adobe, which is great. Great company. Cool. So those are pretty tough competitors. Who else might we can, who do you think we might compete with down the road? Amazon. Amazon? How would that, how would that be? Apple. That would suck. <laughs> <laughs> who else? Google? Yeah. So, it's a terrific time to start. And I think the economy bears this out. Really easy to start. Capital's cheap, office space is cheap, everything you can buy is as a service. But boy, it's got harder and harder to scale. And so if I were to give you a little bit of advice, like if I go back to my career, like these two companies have been very influential on me. I spent 10 years here and five years here. And they were very different. If PTC's CEO was a presidential candidate, It'd be Donald Trump. If Groove Network's CEO was a presidential candidate, he'd be Bernie Sanders. Couldn't have been more different, culturally, everything. And you can see it from the asset allocation. And this company was very sales driven. And I learned how to hire sales reps, fire sales reps, open international offices, build funnels, stuff like that. And it was a machine. And it was, it was a heartless machine. This company, this guy was very good at products. And what he was quite clever at doing was saying, where's technology going in the next few years? Where are humans going in the next few years? How do I build applications and solutions to pull those things together? Uh, he, was, he was quite a clever guy. When we, he built Groove Networks, technology was heading this way, humans, but he was, he was predicting out here. What he built was basically like at, what Atlassian, it was more like Slack plus Dropbox. And it was just early. He was right, but he was early. And so he, I learned a lot. So if I were to give you advice, it's like, how do, I, how do I, one, get some scale up experience? Everyone in Silicon Valley these days, they, there's like this romantic, there's, a, there's like a love of failure. Fail fast, learn from your failures. Of course you want to do that. How else can you learn? Well, from success. You can learn a lot from success, <laughs> right? Go to some place that's had a little bit of success and learn a couple things. What happened to me is I, I joined PTC. There were 200. I left. There were 5,000. We made a lot of mistakes, and we had a lot of failure. What else do we have? A hell of a lot of success. And I tried to take the success and move it here. A lot of failure and success. I, I learned a lot from both. Try to go. I would dissuade you a little bit from going to that little tiny startup, at that 10-person startup. That startup's probably going to fail. Uh, and you will learn from that. But don't get obsessed with all these Silicon Valley blogs that are all about failure and learning from failure. That kind of drives me crazy. I forgot what the question was. You kind of created the question there. <laughs> um, I hadn't asked any. I like the idea, though, of joining, <laughs> joining a scale-up, joining a scale-up. I don't know who that scale-up is. Or even join, go join, go join Amazon. 
you can't lose. I mean, <sighs> that's an incredible company. It's incredible. I would be very careful about where I joined in there, but I think that would be an interesting place. I, yeah, that's a very special place. Google, I don't know. Apple, I don't know. Try to join someplace that's gr still growing and innovating and doing cool stuff, because you learn a lot. When a company's growing and you're a Tuck grad and you're smart, they say, well, who's that smart person from Tuck? Let's move them on that new initiative. Boom, boom, there's a lot of new initiative. Don't go to a company that's not growing. Can I ask a question now? Sure. Cool, <laughs> okay. So I'm, I kind of feel like you've already seen all my questions and kind of are previewing everything. Yep. But uh, since you're talking about a little bit about scaling businesses and you've spent a good deal of your career doing so, you've written books on the subject, um, would you be willing to share um, some more of your insights? You already kind of started to share them about your earlier days working at like PTC. Um, but would you say your opinions and the learnings you've had have changed since being at PTC to now being, you know, where you are at HubSpot? And what would you say is the hardest aspect of scaling a business? And what needs to occur for that success that all of our Tuck MBAs are looking for at Amazon? Amazon's the honest scale up, but you can find <laughs> scale up I things in there, yeah. I like Amazon because they have new stuff that's happening and you can you know, learn new stuff. You don't learn when you're in like some big thing that's sort of incrementally moving. Uh, I, I guess I would just say when you're in startup mode and you've got 30 people, 40 people, like for us, we were really good at marketing and we were really good at selling and we were way out in front and it took us years before our technology kind of caught up with our vision. Very much caught up, and now we're much more a product-driven company than a sales-driven company. I'm really proud of that, actually. Uh, and um, you have to be kind of good at everything. Like I can think of a time at HubSpot when we had a new product that was coming out, and we let our early adopters try it. And the early adopters loved it. We let a couple hundred of our early adopters use it all over it. Feedback was incredible. And we were going to stagger the release of this product to the rest of our customers, but the feedback was so good, we're like, Let's push it out and let's have all, at the time, 5,000 customers enjoy the new functionality. So we push it out. And the, the non-early adopters that didn't opt in were less technically sophisticated and less apt to just figure something out on their own, like most of you are probably quite apt to do that. Uh, and they started calling support. And we like to keep our support wait time under 60 seconds. And we have an SLA around that that we brag about. Um, and it was. You know, 30 minutes. It was a really long wait time, which is a crappy experience. And, the, and the, the spiral that happened was they would call into support. It would say, oh, your approximate wait time is 30 minutes. They would hang up, and then they would call their sales rep. And are sales reps good at answering technical questions? No. They're terrible at it. And they'll either give the wrong answer, or then they'll slack their friend in support. Uh, and then the sales reps aren't selling. And so the next thing you know, you know, as a headwind on new sales, and then people are churning because they're not happy about this. And then people are bitching in Twitter and Facebook and all over the internet. And so it's like we're cranking along up and to the right, and we hit this, it was, it was like a speed bump we hit. And the lesson to me was in scale-up mode, every, everything kind of has to work pretty well all the time. You can't really be bad, really bad at anything. You have to be at least good, hopefully great, at almost everything. And so it's this idea of just building capabilities up over time and getting better. That's one of the things I learned about scaling, is it's, uh, it's harder than it looks. Uh, and everything's got to be tight and work really well. Okay. Should we open it up? Yeah, I think so. Are there any questions? Don't be shy. Please don't be shy. So I have a question. You have extensive experience in sales, and usually like, and they don't, don't provide some sort of like process related to sales. And I think like, I also like see sales experience is crucial to like launching your company, to scale, to raise capital. Can you give some sort of advice how you develop your sales skills like, during your career or like, now? Like what you recommend for future? Yeah. I came up through sales. I was uh, I started my career as the a BDR at PPC. You don't see a lot of big tech companies started by salespeople, um, almost none. 
Uh, it's usually a technologist that starts it. Uh, and I think the VCs don't like it. In fact, they, they discount you. Um, and so it uh, depends on where you want to go. But it, it's helped me, but it's not, it's not central casting at all. And I think pe pe you get an asterisk on you when you came through sales. I would say about MBAs, the attitude towards MBAs has changed a lot, uh, a lot since I got my MBA. And the VCs generally don't like them. Um, and, and I think they don't like them because of a couple reasons. One, they pattern match. They look at who built the really big tech companies. And, you know, it's Gates and it's Zuckerberg and it's all these kids that dropped out of college and were computer scientists. Um, and then they think of MBAs, and I'm one of you, so I think I can say this is a little bit more risk averse. Uh, I mean, like you're, you're taking a more measured path and you're looking at your decision trees and you're making, I would call it a very practical decision by going to business school. So I would say it's fallen out of favor with uh, the founding class. You know, the, the people look at founders and, and it's, they kind of look at you sideways when you've got an MBA now. On, on the flip side, if you look at most of the big tech companies, that next layer of execs are mostly from top tier MBA programs. So if you're looking to found a company, I don't think it's like, oh, you would, they would never found, you know, found, the, the founder would never be an MBA anymore. But it's a little more challenging. Uh, but I think people are very, still very much desire an MBA um, to be running big departments in the company. I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's very popular in, in that realm. I also would say I get three things out of my MBA that I think all three of you, all you guys are getting. I learned a lot. The truth is you can learn a lot anywhere, though. You don't need to go to business school to learn most of it. And you kind of can go to any business school. Like the HubSpot case is taught at Harvard University and taught at some business school you never heard of. Uh, it's kind of the same content. Um, but you get a network, and it's a network of people who are quite bright. You're all quite bright if you're going to Tuck. It's hard to get in here. And you get some pedigree, and that pedigree matters. Uh, when I scan a resume, I hate to say it, but I look, okay, they went to Tuck, they must at least be able to fog a mirror on terms of intelligence. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I got those three things. I think when, the, when I'm thinking about an MBA for people, like my nephew is 25, and he's bright, and he's thinking about getting an MBA. My advice would be only get an MBA if you go to one of the top 10 programs because you can get the knowledge anywhere, but you don't get the pedigree and you don't get the network unless you go to someplace like Tuck or Sloan or HPS or one of the really top tier uh, programs. But I, I, we, we very much like to hire MBAs. My suspicion is that all the big tech companies now like to hire MBAs. So I, I think you all made a wise choice by going to Tuck. Sales, it's hard to learn sales. Like there's not a lot of sales classes in business schools. Sales has changed a lot too. I'm a little dubious of what they teach in business schools about sales. They teach like cold calling and old school techniques and arm twisting and that stuff worked 10, 20 years ago. It's bullshit now, it doesn't work anymore. Um, the, the profile of a sales rep's changed for someone who's very aggressive and very, um, just, just can, can take a no time and time again because they spent their life cold calling and that's how they earn their stripes. The salesperson of today, most of the demand is created by marketing. You don't have to do that really tough work. It's much a, a much smarter person, a much more empathetic person. It's blending with service. And so I don't think it's a terrible route to go graduating um, B school. That would be my first piece of advice, though, and go into sales. Yeah. Yeah. So I imagine as a founder, you probably had a lot of other ideas percolating. Um, You'd be surprised about that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, when I graduated, I had three choices. I went late. I was 36 when I went, uh, 36 years old when I went to business school, or 37 when I graduated. I forgot uh, because I had a pretty good run, and it wasn't a good time to like jump off the the, the treadmill. And Groove got sold to Microsoft. I was like, this is a good time. Uh, and I had three choices at the time. I could go be a VP of sales at kind of any kind of hot startup in Boston. I wanted to stay in Boston. I could go be a CEO of any crap startup in Boston that was looking for a new CEO. I wasn't qualified to get a, like a legit CEO role. 
or I could start this company with Dharmesh. I never thought I would start a company. It, it never was part of my life plan. Like I, I actually sit down every five years and write a life plan, and my goals for my whole life. It wasn't on there. I never thought I would have a good idea. I just never ever thought I would have the moxie to do it. Um, but I like this idea we had of helping small businesses leverage the internet to grow. I like this idea of inbound versus outbound. And I like Dharmesh. Uh, inside of every business school, there's, a, uh, there's two bell, bell curves. <laughs> Sorry. OK, and we have the Halligan's rule of MBAs. This is actually not right. Curve one. One is, 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 is the, the x-axis the x is intelligence. This is the smartest person. This is the least smart person. <laughs> okay? And you have that. You know who, who in the room is. The, probably the smartest person might be in the room. You know, you, know, you all have that invisible bell curve in your heads. <laughs> I don't have a more polite view of this, but this is maybe the, the nicest person, and this is the biggest douchebag. <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> you know. You know what I'm talking about. Darmesh was this one. But he was the smartest one. He got, uh, he got perfect GMAT score. He got perfect GPA, which is, by the way, no one gives a crap what your GPA is in case you're worried about it. Uh, he had a, but he had, he had a perfect GPA. He always had the smartest comments in class. He's a genius. He's, he's a genius. He's very quiet, so it's hard to say he was the nicest. He wasn't the most popular, but, whatever. but he was well, well, well on this side of the curve. Uh, he's a little bit of a, my dad died 15 years ago. Loved my dad. I really looked up to my dad. And he's kind of the reincarnation of my dad. My dad was this guy. He was as smart as a whip, and he was the nicest guy on the planet, highest, highest integrity. And so I got very, very lucky with Darmesh that when we looked at each other and we drew our Venn diagrams, like, you want, when you're founding, you want a Venn diagram like this. I was a sales guy. He was a tech guy. And we had some overlapping interests. We liked this idea of SaaS, which was kind of like a new idea back in 2006. Uh, we liked the idea of instead of selling to enterprises, and, and, and we wanted to sell to small businesses, just more fun, more energizing, helping the little guy beat the big guy. We had an interest in strategy. We had an interest in swinging hard in, in going for something very big versus selling out early. Uh, and this relationship is part of the real key of HubSpot that's worked out because I'm quite capable in certain areas, it turns out. He's quite capable in other areas. I have opinions here, his opinions here, but we're very balanced and add a lot of value to each other. And I, I forgot what the question was, but I got a very good co- Oh, the question was why HubSpot? Part of, a lot of it was Darmesh talked me into the damn idea. Uh, <laughs> and I remember the day he did it. Do you guys have some sort of co-working space here, or WeWork or something, in, in, in town, in Hanover? We have one. It's called CIC. It's right off campus at Sloan. He had an office there. And we had been having, we had started, they didn't really start the company, but we're kind of working on it in school. And it was not obvious it was a great idea at the time. Uh, and I remember one day we sat and we whiteboarded out a whole bunch of stuff. And he just went in for the clothes, which isn't like him. He was like, dude, let's start this company. Stop interviewing these other places. Let's do it. This is going to work. And I was just, I caught me, he frankly caught me in a weak moment. I was like, all right, <laughs> sure. My other, I had some other options. They were good. I didn't know. And I was just like, fuck it, I'll do it. And I'll do it for six months, and we'll see what happens. Um, and he wouldn't have started it unless he could talk me into doing it. He wasn't going to do it. He was only going to do it because we were kind of a, kind of a perfect match. And then if I were to describe how HubSpot's gone, everyone thinks it looks like a rocket ship from the outside. It's really not. It's, you know, it's a sine wave up and to the right. We've had some low, low, low lows. And we're in a kind of a really high, high, high point right now. Um, but it's been up and down. But that first six months, it's just kind of steady progress. Two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. So in six months, I ask myself, is this, is this going to happen? Is this, is this a good idea? I was like, yeah, it's going pretty well. We weren't killing it. Uh, 
product was terrible. We had a bunch of visitors to our blog. You know, if a Martian looked down to HubSpot and said that, you know, that, that what's the odds that's going to turn into a big public successful tech company? They were saying, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, but it was persistence, just stayed at it. Two, two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. And the founding relationship's really key. Uh, you mentioned some challenges that you faced scaling up. I was wondering if there were, uh, if you could speak to challenges that you had either in the employee or the culture side that came to scaling up. We, had, we the, the, one of the most challenging parts of uh, moments in HubSpot is we have we had an employee named Dan Lyons who's a writer for uh, the show Silicon Valley. You ever seen the show? Uh, he worked for us for a couple years. We let him leave and, and write some episodes for Silicon Valley. He was extreme. We have the happiest employees like in the world. He was miserable, hated. I sat next to him for part of it. I could tell he was miserable. And he left and he wrote a book about how much he hated HubSpot. That book became a bestseller on the New York Times bestseller list. And in the book, he went to great pains to describe how what idiots the founders were. <laughs> that was a long day, the day I read that book. Uh, and so that was a down. In, in that, our customers read it, our employees read it, our employees' parents read it. It was a few years ago. That was a tough, tough chapter. <sighs> really tough chapter. And you're not, like, you're probably a normal human being. You grew up in a normal home, and you had a job before you came here. You're probably a banker or consultant. You go to business school. Like, you get this normal life. All of a sudden, you get the New York Times writing about what an idiot you are. It was very trying. Uh, like, I read the New York Times every Sunday, and one Sunday I open it up, and it's like an article about what an idiot I am. That was hard, and you're not trained for it in business school. Uh, and that, that was a very challenging moment. We've had other challenging, but that was, that for me personally, that was extremely challenging. It's like three years ago. And we made some big mistakes during it and leading up to it, but it's, it has, that's, hasn't been easy. Yeah, hasn't all been roses. Yes, sir. So I, I work at Ernst & Young, so congratulations on the Entrepreneur of the Year Award. <laughs> and my question was, uh, you know, just along the lines of uh, what is, you know, HubSpot doing to stay ahead of the competition and 6,000 or so companies that you know, try to do similar things? Uh, that's an excellent question. I think if we had just stuck with, I had a, draw, a picture up there before, a marketing app to marketing, to front office suite, to front office platform. I think if we had just stayed as a marketing app, I don't think we'd still be standalone. Salesforce would have bought some, we would have had to sell to somebody at this point. Uh, we've had to continue to evolve our value prop um, and expand the value we deliver. And that's, that's been helpful. I think anchoring ourselves not in what marketers and sellers want, but in human behavior and teaching marketers and sellers what they want has helped a lot. I think our culture, um, you know, we're, I think we're, the, I honestly think we're one of the best companies to work for in the world. Glassdoor and comparably all confirm it, our employees confirm it. Uh, we spend a lot of energy on that. Our, uh, our partner program, and so we sell HubSpot through a direct sales force, and we also have a reseller program. So if you're a marketing agency, let's say, you can and you're building websites, you can build them on HubSpot and upsell them all kinds of services. Uh, so we've got some moats around our business, and we're constantly trying to build additional moats and additional value, and we don't sit still. I think what happens in a lot of tech companies, I think the reason tech companies' founders stay in pace so long, and the reason so many stumble when the founder steps aside, is you have to keep pressing hard on the future, and you can't live in the present. You have to push hard and build new stuff and stay ahead of the competition because, you know, Adam Smith used to talk about capitalism as this invisible hand of capitalism. It's more like a very, like, visible fist of capitalism. Capital is so efficient. If there's, people don't even, it used to be that, oh, capital would flow towards where profits are, and those profits would shrink because more people would go after it. And then it was capital would go after where revenue is. Capital now would just go after visitors to a website. Uh, it is very efficient, and it moves very efficiently when there's opportunity. And lots of capital has come at us. And I think the idea of just continuing to push, continue to innovate, and continue to get better, that's served us well. And I think founder-led companies, like if you're going to go to work for a company, a founder-led company typically will be like that. You can see what happened with, with uh, Microsoft. When Balmer took over, they sort of lost that innovation. They lost that drive. And they lived in the present, not the future. 
the new guy has done a fantastic job of reorienting towards the future. That's exceptionally hard to do as an outsider in a, as an outsider hired into a company or even an insider promoted up through. Um, but we continue to press, and we're not. We all we both also we want to build a company that will be around for decades that our our kids and our grandkids will be proud of. Like my dad worked for GE and he worked for BBN, and I kind of I'm proud of that. Yeah, it's kind of cool. I want my kid to be like, yeah, my dad started HubSpot, and I want his friends to have heard of it. 30 years from now. And so a constant pushing on innovating and, and keeping up and getting better, I think that served us quite well. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you wish you knew when you were in business school? Say it again? What do you wish you knew back when you were in business school? Oh, I wish I knew. OK, I'll give you a couple things. Uh, a lot of the stuff we learned in business school is very useful, and we still use it all the time. Like all the stuff you learn in stats, everything about stats is useful. I think I wish I would have taken more stats classes. Everyone bitched about our first year stats class, but it was awesome. Um, finance, so useful. You think about like, wow, this is so all this stuff we're talking about is so weird. It's so useful. Like. We raised debt, it was a very complicated instrument. We went public, we raised venture capital rounds, all those were useful. I took an entrepreneurial finance class, incredibly useful. That's really complicated. Uh, and it's a little hard to learn on your own. So entrepreneurial finance finance were very, very useful. The strategy classes were useful. We use five forces, like you look in any given whiteboard at HubSpot and there'll be a Michael Porter five forces or there'll be Clay Christensen stuff on the whiteboard. We talk about the innovator's dilemma all the time. I wish I had taken an M&A class, I didn't. Uh, now we're starting to deal with that. I took a bunch of the required organizational development and leadership classes. I kind of rolled my eyes at them. They were good. I, I, I wish I had paid better attention to that stuff. It's remarkably useful, uh, the business school curriculum. Uh, at least it's loan. It was, it was good. I wish I paid a little, little more attention to some of those things. The core curriculum, useful. Economics, useful. Um, we talk about that stuff all the time. It's the lingua franca of HubSpot. It's not like we went to business school. It's like, oh, we learned all that. That's over. Now we're going to do real stuff. That is the real stuff. Um, we had a lot of guest speakers. I would take advantage of that. I don't know if it's probably harder to get them up here than it is in Boston. Um, but we had a lot in, in Sloan. And we were in, I remember one. It was the founder of Sam Adams. Uh, I forgot his name. Uh, yeah. And I just remember him doing his presentation. And uh, back then, Sam Adams was one of a handful of microbrews, or you know, I'm a beer drinker, so it was one of the handful of beers that I like now. There's a gajillion. Uh, and uh, th just thinking, hearing his story about how he started a company, and I never thought I would start a company until that day he presented. I was like, maybe I could do it. Yeah, maybe I could do it. Yeah, maybe that's not so crazy. So I got inspired by a lot of those outside speakers. Uh, well, those are some of the things. Yeah, I loved it. Uh, some of the best times in my life. I learned a lot. It's highly, highly applicable. Yes, sir. Uh, you wrote a book about marketing lessons from the Grateful Dead. I wonder if you had any general management or like, like other lessons from the Grateful Dead that you use. <laughs> you know, like, I'm a big fan, so that's what I was wondering. I got my mushroom socks on. <laughs> uh, anyone of Grateful Dead, any Grateful Dead fans? Not really. Fish? Really? No fish fans? Yeah. Uh, general management lessons. Jer the Grateful Dead were, uh, were led by a guy named Jerry Garcia. And uh, he was a reluctant leader. He was a band leader, but he never said he was a leader. No one ever said he was a leader, but he was, he was the alpha dog. And I don't think he ever really made any decisions. He just sort of hinted at it, and he was very good at building consensus and whatnot. I like that about him. I also like that he hated conventional wisdom. And so the, everything they did when it came to sales and marketing is, no, just because everyone does it that way doesn't mean it's right. They do it that way because the incentives are set up that way, but that's just stupid. And I'll give you an example. I got like a 1,000 examples. I got to pick one. Uh, ticket sales. Back in the day when you went to the Rolling Stones, you would wait till the day the tickets went on sale. You would call until your fingers bled trying to get through the ticket master line. Um, and finally, you get 
through the line and there'd be like no tickets left or really crappy tickets left and you buy those crappy tickets. Who do you think bought all the tickets? Scalpers. Okay. And so when Jerry thought about it, he said, well, who's making all the money in this room? Who's making all the money? Well, the scalpers made a bunch. Who else made money? Ticketmaster made a lot of money. Where were their best fans sitting? sitting? Who was in the front row? Venture capitalists and bankers. Where were their, favorite, their best fans? In the back. And so Jerry's like, this is bullshit. Yeah, everyone does it this way, of course. They do it because Ticketmaster runs this. So he said, enough. We're not selling through Ticketmaster. We're setting up our own ticketing company. And, uh, and so you bought tickets directly from Griffith. They cut, they, and they cut out Ticketmaster there. Now, how did they cut out the scalpers? Okay, I'll give you a hint. So if you want to go to a Grateful Dead concert, you, uh, you had to fill out a four by six. First of all, you had to call into the number, and it was recording, so you didn't have to wait. And it was a lady from the West Coast, and there goes 415 number, and she would, she would tell you how to buy. And here's how you buy. You would fill out a four by, two, four by six card with how many tickets you wanted and the price, you're in, and, the price and a couple details on it. And then you would put in a, a, a self-addressed stamped envelope, and then you mail it in. What were the maximum number of tickets you could buy for a concert? Four. That's how they cut out the middlemen. How did they decide who got the front of the best seats? Lottery? Think back about what I just said. Whoever mailed in first. Everyone mailed in the same day. Who waits in the line? What? Who comes early and waits in the line? No line. Remember that self-addressed stamped envelope? How far are you coming from? How beautiful the drawing on there you could make of mushrooms of dancing bears with glitter on it and glue and like the better design and art you had on the damn self-addressed stamped envelope, the more likely you were to get the front row. And so they had their best fans in the front row who would never sell to a scalper and you only could buy four tickets a time. That's one of like 40 examples of how he's like, he just was hated conventional wisdom about everything, his music and whatever. And so that inspired us at HubSpot. It inspired a lot of things in HubSpot. We, we are not big fans of conventional wisdom. Most stuff is a bunch of BS, uh, and we try to rethink it whenever we can. Um, I think I'm out of time. I think we're just about out of time, um, but that's a good place to end. It's a very inspiring session today. And um, you know, I think, as you hinted to or, or, or mentioned, you know, you're proud of your company and things. And I think having someone who's been named a top CEO by Glassdoor four or five times is, is a real treat for us. And on behalf of you know, the whole talk in here, me from the Center for Digital Strategy, I want to thank you for studying, spending some time with us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.